<clears throat> hey there, everybody. Welcome. Eric's going to join us in just a second. Um, and this is uh, definitely a Q&A kind of time. So if you want to um, ask any questions, uh, feel free to unmute your, your uh, camera and your audio. And Eric can, um, you know, chime in. Uh, are you joining us now? Sure. I, I'm going to keep an eye on uh, the computer so I, I know when to let people in. Actually, we can do it from here. Uh, now that I think about it. Hello, everyone. We can wait just a second. Maybe. Sure. Enjoy the view. <laughs> the view doesn't doesn't. Suck, that's it. No. And today is actually glorious Napa Valley. Yeah, it is. A perfect spring day out here. I <laughs> Which I feel bad even mentioning, but you know, nobody is sending me. That's okay. Uh, that's right. Right. <laughs> um that's I was out for a vineyard block and it's just it's absolutely cool. <laughs> <laughs> there's no one out there, which is <laughs> our best words in the East Coast, uh, especially, you know, right now I always think of Midwest and East Coast. Um, I, when I first started doing these, I had tastings with my friends in Vermont. The snow was coming down, and it was like this outside, <laughs> 75 degrees. Uh, yesterday was a little windy in the Napa Valley, but um, this is not such a bad way to social di socially distance. Um, <laughs> Can you hand me the 18? Yeah, absolutely. It, my parents got, I think, about seven inches of snow in Minnesota yesterday. So. Hey, Dave, welcome. Uh, seven inches of snow. Wow. And the day before, it was beautiful. Um, so that's the uh, crankiness of the Midwest. That's As people it. log on, I'll just continue to log everyone on, you guys. Uh, we've got a fun one teed up today. I, I, yeah. I love abdicating a wine discussion. <laughs> To a winemaker <laughs> and so one of the things that's really um continues actually it's uh, it's watching the wine two things they might want you uh you the question uh so many not muted during the session uh, every period infiltrate these parish that's right good Bad. Uh, but anyway, if you, uh, you're all welcome to ask questions and please do. Uh, but uh, while you're not questions, mute computer. So uh, mute, mute your mic computer if you can. Throughout as well. Um, so pretty. Well, anyway, today Eric's going to explain some things about Pinot Noir and it's. Uh, there are a lot of things that have surprised me, uh, most recently coming to Bouchain, the, the differences in the Pinot Noir clones. Yeah. And the other thing that's really surprised me, and I, I didn't really under, understand is the wrong word, but I didn't have a full uh, appreciation of it, is how shocking it is to try wines, the same wine made by the same people from the same vineyard from two different years. When I grew up in Vermont, I remember... Um, you know, I drink practically the same wine uh, at my favorite restaurant every night, and then the the vintage would change, and I would think, oh my God, you know, what happened? Did someone die? I and mean, what? How did they screw up my favorite wine? And so, Eric, you can discuss how you screwed up. Let's you say how it happens. <laughs> Uh, is are we dark? Does it look like we're pretty dark? I think, no, well, you, we just can't see ourselves. Oh, okay. I tested this out yesterday. We should be okay. Okay. Um, but I could also do this, bring it down just a little yeah. bit. Yeah, let's get warmer. Bake ourselves, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just like, <laughs> so my, The only thing traveling these days is my hair. <laughs> <laughs> my forehead gets all hot these days. Uh, this gives me a good excuse to use a toupee, which I definitely need anyway. Uh, but just to protect you myself. Bend back and laugh. <laughs> 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 we're keeping uh, it loose here. yeah there's uh, uh, not a lot of formality to these things <laughs> as you will see we're recording some of these because um you know it's not often that us in the tasting Ooh, room Harry. oh perfect get a chance to uh ask questions for um of a winemaker i don't know what happened when we can't get her in but i'll do it for over here no she should be in there we go and and killer probably my mom nice and um, i think it's my mother hello Patty. Good. Welcome, everybody. If um, we can do Q&As today, no, Mom, I can't get a haircut yet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess 
thinking about just <laughs> chopping my own hair off. I've done that a couple of times. Shaggy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, there. And then he walks, she's in. And I go, here's... So, um, it, today yeah, we can be interactive. So, uh, until you're ready to ask your question, mute your, uh, your mics. And you can also mute your cameras if you don't want to be seen on the screen. And if you do, when you talk, uh, you can be seen by everybody. Um, today we're going to pierce uh, the, some of the history of Pinot Noir in the Napa Valley. Yeah. And then also talk about something which, even though I'm a grizzled Napa Valley veteran at this point, or at least grizzled, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> one of the things I, but one of the things that really does always surprise me is the shocking difference between vintages, yeah. and uh, so we're here. Eric's going to tell us about the difference between the seventeen and the eighteen vintage, and also uh, impart a little bit of um, background about the California heritage clone, the swan, yeah. so-called swan clone, which we've got planted in the in the, in our vineyard. So Eric, yeah, I think Pinot you know, is a fun variety in general to really look at the vintage variation of wines. Sometimes it's harder in some of these bigger wines because the nuance doesn't poke out as much. And with Pinot, I, I don't feel like the wine has to be as old. Like you can see those changes earlier on. You just don't with, believe in the, the differences between Cabernet and Vintage <laughs> too. <laughs> just yeah, what I was say. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but although, you know, one thing that you two have really prevailed upon my consciousness is this idea that actually Pinot Noir is the incredibly expressive red wine yeah. grape with such variation. Yeah. And it not only occurs in the bottle, but apparently there's a sort of a genetic instability in the vineyard. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah, Pinot Noir is one of the most ancient of varieties in terms of length, right? And so it's had more time to mutate. And that's why we see so much different differentiation in these in these wines. And one thing I like to talk about when it's the discussion of clones for wines, like what is a clone of Pinot? All these wines that we make, Dijon, Pomard, uh, Swan clones, the St. Clair, these are different clones of Pinot Noir. And the way I personally like to think about what makes a clone a clone is I equate it to human beings. If we take somebody from all the different continents, minus Antarctica, um, but Asian um, and uh, South American, African, if, if you line up these human beings next to each other, their DNA is all human being, but there's inherent differences. Highs and skin tone and, uh, did I say highs? Size, height. Uh, so there are inherent differences and in various uh, visual, obvious differences in these human beings. And just like Pinot, it's all genetically Pinot Noir but they have their inherent differences. And so- Different kids. Yeah. <laughs> and so be it um, skin thickness of the berry or the cluster morphology, these things will all lend to the differences in the actual wine that they make over time. So Swan, which our subject is today, um, <clears throat> its history is, um, here we go. We're adding people as we go along. So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, <laughs> So Swan Clone, at least here on our property, doesn't have a huge cluster. Sometimes the berries can be big and small within one cluster. Um, not a lot of thickness to the skins, and so that's why we tend to end up with a much lighter wine, and that's part of it at least. Um, and then, so we've covered clones a little bit, so that's going to be a, a, a thing that differentiates one of these things in the Swan Clone. And then... Um, Others, obviously, is where it's grown. Um, for us here on our property, where are we? So our swan clone as well. You guys don't know where I'm pointing. Um, Over here. <laughs> <laughs> it lies in this swale. And so one of the things they're actually doing, you might see a tractor come behind us right now, is they're disking it. They're cultivating the land. And so when we pruned uh, the end of February, all those clippings went onto the ground and they came through and they chopped in, they broke up and chopped all those prunings and mowed down all the cover crop that we had. And so now they're coming through and they're cultivating, they're tilling in all that uh, matter. And so it becomes, we're returning nutrients to the soil. Do you get nervous about chopping up the, the uh, 
the root systems when you do that? No, they're not going that deep for us. And so this is, I don't know how many inches really, but it's not really going to do too much. It'd be like if I was out there with a pickaxe doing it myself. <laughs> it would, I wouldn't get very Can far. Can I take a video? Way. Sure, sure. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> I swear words be a toss I, I just thought of something new you can do. Forget about making one. There it goes. <laughs> Here's a shovel. That's fun. Um, and so we're going through right now and cultivating the land. And one thing that we're, we're trying to do is, one, we're returning nutrients to the soil. And then we're also um, eliminating any competition for the vines that cover crop if we were to leave it out there that would compete for water and nutrients with the vines throughout the growing season and so it, when we till under those cover crops and the and the, ch the clippings or choppings from the actual vines after pruning we're eliminating some of that competition for for nutrients and, and most importantly water really throughout the year and so going back to our swan block it sits in this swale and so we have two kind of upper levels to it and then this lower part that captures more moisture throughout the year so with all that extra moisture when you combine that with our clay soils where the water tends to sit on top of that and be held in those clay soils a lot then we in that swale we get a bushier vine and so it wants to grow more and so what we actually do to complicate things for our growers out here is we leave the two kind of higher areas without any cover crop and then we leave some cover mm. crop so he goes through he tills he tills gets to the swale pulls up the 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 discs leaves it and then gets to the next higher part tills it again now i, I have a question <clears throat> so given the name of the today's club the swan club would it actually benefit this to be able to pond for them so it could sell? <laughs> Absolutely. Does the so swan we'll bring clone, that up in our budget? Does, is the swan clone named because it likes more water? It is named for Joseph Swan. And so Joseph Swan was uh, one of these pioneer farmers and winemakers of the probably the 60s, I guess. My history is a little shady. Um, you can see that in my grades in college and high school. Uh, uh, back. Um, and so I believe it was in the 60s, early 70s. What we have California heritage clones is oftentimes these things do Hang on a second, you guys. If you don't have your mic uh, for this part, later on you can ask Eric if you can uh, unmute your mic. But for now, uh, well, we're being profound. Uh, <laughs> if you could mute your mic. Important things to say. And then, uh, <laughs> and then just uh, unmute now. Question if you want to. Coffee in their kitchen. <laughs> this is not our normal cooking, cooking class. Show. We have a cooking class tomorrow. You can shop with us. But uh, if you could, please um, unmute your microphone on your computer or iPhone you're using. It'd be great. We appreciate so, the uh, so Joseph, multitasking. What you're saying is Joseph Swan was not a swimmer. He didn't prefer water. And his clone, the Swan clone, doesn't prefer more water than no. a Mard clone or anything like that. No, nope, not so much. And so they, what, what happened with these California Heritage clones, we talk about um, Swan Calera, some other, not all these things, they escape me. But they 828, went, even I know that, <laughs> Dijon 114, come on, Eric. <laughs> well, those technically are Heritage clones. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. Yeah. So someone went over to oftentimes was Burgundy, France, and took cuttings from that they didn't like. So they tasted these wines. They said, where is this from? Talk to the uh, bakers and vintners. And they tasted these wines said, oh, this is amazing. Where is it grown? They went and got clippings. And then we call them suitcase clones. They chuck it in their suitcase or they tied it to their leg or they swallowed it for the trip ride home. And then, <laughs> and then when they got back, I'm not going to get into that metaphor with you. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> and then uh, planted and propagated these vines in California or Oregon. And then... Meaning what? They took the clippings from France yeah, so the, the, and the, just stuck them in the ground? Well, they have buds on them. And the bud, cut out a bud and plant, or, and bud it on to graft it onto a vine. And then that... That fruiting body is called the scion. That scion of the vine, the fruiting body part, is going to be from that growing material. And so that bud would be the Pinot Noir that they took. They became, uh, they planted it in California. It becomes the coronavirus. Oh, she's <laughs> up. They very much so frown upon <laughs> the transferring of plant material. 
uh, between. But it takes over the old vine, is what you're saying. Yeah, so it would normally be a rootstock, which isn't going to root anyways. And then uh, they plant it or they graft it. Rootstock grows up and they will plant a vineyard of that. They find the vines within it that they like, and then they will continue to take buds from that and then uh, propagate it. And so eventually they sort of have their clone that's been grown in their soils on their site. So even if we take a, a bud from wherever, once we plant it on our site, it's really gonna interact with the terroir. It does have those interact, um, those uh, inherent sort of myths to it. It's got its thicker, thin skins. It's got its cl cluster morphology. But when you plant it on a new site, it's gonna really be, um, it's going to f sort of find its true self there in that spot. I know that Chris told me that the Dijon clone on our old vineyard takes on a more earthy characteristic than in some vineyards. Swan is planted all over Sonoma, right? Is What do you find is unique to the Swan clone on our property? To our property, well, I guess I haven't had enough Swan clone from around the other places. They all have this sort of inherent uh, lighter color to them. For us, what we really see here on our site is that real fresh sort of strawberry, especially when it's young and in barrel, that I, we call it strawberry tops, like that part of the strawberry that's just going from white to red. And so that strawberry top is real fresh, it's got, and it's got that fresh cinnamon to it as well, without any oak being really um, injected into the wine. It's not, because you do get these sort of baking spices from oak specifically, but the, the the Swan Club has that real sort of beautiful, fresh spiciness, almost a nutmeg, but more real, like a cinnamon quality to it. Inherent in the juice itself mm -hmm. and from the skins. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things that blew me away when I got here is that you and Chris opt for only a roughly 11 month barrel time, yeah, really uh, which which is different from every other winery I've been to. I've heard for, for Pinot Noir, sometimes you'll hear 14 months or 12 or, uh, Cabernet, sometimes it's two years, yeah. but 18 you hear a lot in Napa yeah, Valley. Yeah. So at 11 months, obviously, you're, you, you're riding this delicate ride of overwhelming the fruit and the natural yeah, inherent yeah, sure. quality or maybe not having enough complexity. What, um, how, do you, how do you ride that dance with the Swan clone versus the Dijon clone or the Pomar clone? Is yeah. there a difference? There's definitely a difference. We sort of feel like, you know, that's a, a moving target for us and it's not set in stone. We do need to make room for the next coming vintage in our cellar. And so for a lot of these wines, we'll get them out of barrel at that point in time. But for instance, in 2018, we held over our terraces and our G over vintage. And so those stayed in closer to that 14, 15 oh, months oh. because they weren't. Thanks quite for letting me know, Eric. <laughs> Hello. I was like an idiot now. <laughs> You could have told me that before this meeting. Uh, so why did you do it? So it just felt like it needed that um, added complexity to it. Because um, the oak is going to add something, especially the sort of, if you think of a wine on your palate, it's, I, I truly think of it in three parts, the entry, the mid palate, and then the finish. If you broke it up into just the front end and the back end, for me, it adds the barrel aging is gonna add more on the back end, especially rounding out the middle, but then adding some complexity to its structure on that back end hmm. of the wine. If we've, we've, well, what we did feel, especially with the terraces and the G, is that it just needed that extra layer. You know, barrels do add layers of complexity to a wine overall, versus then the Swan, we don't need, we don't need especially any real oak um, added to it beyond that 10 months. There's, we just tasted the 2019 in barrel and we're tasting it and thinking, man, we could bottle it right now. Wow. Yeah, wow. but we won't because it's fun to see how it's gonna evolve and age through the aging process. But <clears throat> especially with the Swan, if we looked at all of our wines, the Swan is the one that's not gonna need the oak as much as any of the yeah. other ones. So, I mean, when you evoke the, the terraces and the G to me, they're two of our heavier wines, a fuller, slightly fuller body than the Swan, maybe less, in some ways, delicate in their aroma. Sure. Um, is that part of the reason why they can handle a little bit more oak? Yeah, or is definitely. It, okay. Yeah. For, for us, at least, uh, in our opinion. Yeah. Wine is so open to interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody out there is going, BS! <laughs> so if I wanted to call the Swan clone, 
classically, if, if Pinot Noir is a ballerina, the Swan Clone is the ba prima ballerina. The ballerina of the yeah. ballerina, it's delicate. Yeah. It's a th ethereal, almost. Mm -hmm. Your um, terrace is more of like the high school cheerleader, the guy holding the Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it's interesting when you look at uh, a map of any vineyard, there are parts, well, that's not true. I suppose if you had a vineyard out over near Sacramento, it would just be hot the entire yeah, yeah. Old place. One of the big differences between Napa and and other great wine regions of the world, Sonoma, et cetera, uh, areas in Turkey and Greece and France, is that you know in a within a long par five, if you're a golfer, yeah. <laughs> uh, the topography can change, and and depending on when you're getting morning sun or afternoon sun, the expression of that part of the vineyard can change. The, so can the soil. Our swan being not in a pond, but in, the, in a swale, yeah. does it get a substantially different because of the, either the vine direction or the, the, whatever, the, the way it was planted, a different type of sunlight it in the terraces? It does because um, our terraces wraps around an actual hillside. And so that sees a couple different exposures Maybe for the sake of this um, subject, we could talk about our Dijon versus the Swan. And so the Dijon, our, our, our rows are planted north-south. And so when you have a north-south um, row orientation, I'll point sort of this way because this is our north. Getting snobby now. We get, yeah, yeah. we get a morning sun and an afternoon sun. And so when those clusters are running north-south, the morning sun isn't as intense. And so we pull off more leaves on that side so we get more direct sunshine as the sun <clears throat> excuse me passes to the afternoon the in intensity of the heat uh, increases and so we leave more leaves on that side um, we pull off some and so it's more of a we call it a dappled sunlight exposure because if we were to pull too many leaves you would get more sunburn it'd be sort of like you put more suntan on yourself if you're going to go out by the yeah, one exactly. o'clock and then in the morning you don't have to worry so much, yeah, it's pretty much. whereas our <laughs> my toupee swan? goes on in the afternoon and in the morning, you don't have to worry about it okay whereas our swan clone is east west and so oh. on that your north side is never really going to see direct sunlight and so we can pull more leaves oh. on that side and we leave more of the uh, uh, leaf cover creating more of the dappled sunlight on the south side because the sun is passing at an arc but it's usually in the, the southern hemisphere would you ever um, consider like just pulling the north side and making a north northern facing swan clone in you could, sun? yeah certainly people and for both row, row orientations people do pick a north versus south or an east versus west <laughs> sometimes we try not to be too Big pain in the butt. If anybody's heard of my joke when we're out in the vineyard, it's that uh, a vineyard's biggest pest is a winemaker. So <laughs> I, I had an interview with a with a wine grower uh, who has a major vineyard, and he's like, you know, the thing I hate most is when young winemakers come and tell me how to cultivate my vines, <laughs> and I'll just shake my head and tell them I do it. And then he says, my biggest trick is I just wait. I, I wait till they leave. Then they cultivate the first maybe 30 <laughs> yards yeah. the way they wanted to, but they never go past that to yeah. check the rest of the vineyard. You'd have to get out of your truck to do that. Yeah, <laughs> but one of the things that I knew that obviously we have here, uh, Bouchain is con constructed of roughly 100 acres of vines, and Eric and Chris do, in fact, <laughs> <I did. laughs> monitor the, the vine vineyard. I walk the vineyard. Yeah. I've seen you out there. Yeah. Uh, tell me something, just in general, before we get into the differences between the 17 and 18 vintage, what do you think wineries like Bouchain with their vineyard. One of the reasons we wanted to have these uh, virtual uh, tastings here and this for, from this perspective is to showcase our vineyard right behind us. And we're not a fake brand. We're not yeah. a Kung Fu girl. We're not just a, a, some cool name, the, uh, the nasty center or something. Um, we actually have a vineyard and it's old. It so, is, yeah. um, you know, I know as the vineyard gets older, it loses more and more of its volume, and with any hope, it gains more and more complexity. Yeah, yeah for sure. What have we gained through the Swan Clone ver uh, from the Copeland's and Chris's commitment to an old vineyard versus if we just plowed the thing down and, and yeah. had twice as much? Yeah, so with, with the age of, I believe our Swan was planted in 96, and so it has shown some virus in the vines, and so... When you have age and virus out there competing or, you know, 
a vineyard, like something's always trying to kill your vineyard. You too much water. <laughs> talk about the coronavirus. <laughs> too much drought, too much water, too much disease, too much fungal infection, whatever. And so there's so many things out there that want to try to harm your vineyard, even though a vine is essentially a weed. Um, we, with our a swan weed costs uh, $350,000 an acre. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> it's the most beloved across the world. <laughs> Um, but between the age and the sort of the virus that comes in there, it, it keeps our crop yield down, which is a nice thing because it doesn't want to throw too much crop. Even though, like I said, in that swale, it tends to get real bushy, um, it's not producing so much crop that we really have to go out there and monitor and try to uh, thin it too much. And so it, that self-regulation of an older vine is a real benefit to us because you can sort of let it do its thing and we don't have to go out there and worry and uh, pick apart. And, well, I know I drove by a vineyard is quite kind of unrelated, but not really. I drove by a vineyard earlier today. It's still not the canes are still not chopped back yet. Last year's growth is still dead in the water. Yeah. But now, unlike it was three weeks ago, the all of the old cane is flowering. It looks yeah. like it's going to have whatever ten tons of fruit or something. They didn't prune it. They didn't and prune they, it. Yeah, and so and I think they're going to pull it out. They're going to pull it. And yeah, unfortunately. But if they didn't, if they just go to town with it and they end up with uh, whatever, 10 times the amount of fruit they would normally mm. have on that same vine, yeah. would, do they have a chance of good flavor? It's going to dilute it out when you're talking. I mean, even small percentages can sometimes dilute out your flavors if you're 20% over on crop. Or 10%, really, like you can really see a flavor change in that wine. And not for the better. Not for the better, necessarily. It's, it's like having a tea terms. and putting too much water in with the tea yeah, bag for or sure. something like that. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, like I used uh, last Friday for anyone who sat through my diatribe on rosé, the, the analogy was uh, lemonade. If you had too much lemon, you could oh, dump in more sure. water to dilute that flavor out. And so it's just pure dilutionary, you know, physics or whatever it is at that point. The more fruit that you have on something, if it only has the capacity to really ripen X, if you have X plus Y, then, or a certain percentage, it it's not going to be able to ripen it at the same um, degree of ripeness. So I had a winemaker once tell me that if you have too much leaves on a vine, your your wine will start tasting like a leaf. It, but, so if you have a, just a bunch of, of berries out there and you just decide to go to town and develop a tree out of that <laughs> thing, um, so you have the same leaf to berry ratio, I suppose you still end up with dilution because there's only one trunk. Is that the deal? Pretty much. It would all depend. It's all an amount of balance, really, because between the different ways we prune a vine, um, cane versus cordon or spur pruning, what we're really trying to do is balance out an individual vine and say, here's how much fruit we think should be on this thing. Dep you know, sometimes they have four arms or sometimes it's one. It's you know, how much is the soil able to uh, provide in terms of nutrients and water and uh, how much can this vine actually produce? Mm. And so uh, w those are things you just learn year after year. And and so with our swan, that age, that um, ability to sort of temper how much fruit it's going to give us is a real benefit. And that's why even though it shows certain signs of virus in the spot, we're not going to pull it anytime soon because it just provides or produces this beautiful wine year after year. You know, quintessentially one of my favorites. It's just you know, it <laughs> as as we sit here next to the, the in one glass we've got the seventeen, the other one the eighteen. Those of you who are in our wine club just got the eighteen shipped to you, and I'm here to tell you, in my estimation, it's a it's a monster compared to the <laughs> gentle 17. And I noticed the same thing when the 17 first came out. Much more, uh, I don't know, what I, you know, if, if, the, if the older 17, you know, if the 17 now is uh, this delicate little uh, sailboat, the, yeah. se the 17, uh, when it first came out, was, you know, a big oil ship, shipper or something. <laughs> um, like you see in the San Francisco Bay, we can almost see the San Francisco yeah. Bay from the top of our vineyard, by the way. If any of you have not been out there, you can, you can look down the entire northern part of the San Francisco Bay. But uh, so what's going on? Because uh, I was surprised when Chris told me that the Swan, even though it's our most delicate wine, has obviously thin skins as a consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a consequence, you would think it would be the first Pinot yeah. that would come in. Delicate, dainty, like my skin on the first day of summer, or my suntan is over. 
Um, and obviously, I no longer hang time, just like with our, our suntan. And, and, just hanging uh, my job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're out in the sun every day in the summer, you get a more and more thorough yeah. tan. That's what happens with our grapes. Why is it that the swan clone doesn't come in first and then our more heavy-duty yeah. terraces? It is actually the opposite of what we would think. Our Dijon, which has the darkest skin, our swan, which has the lightest color, well, so it, maybe not skin, but uh, the darkest wine comes from our Dijon block, and then our lightest pinot comes from our swan block. The reasoning that we were just discussing, swan, it's not going to have, it must come in first because of that light yeah. color, the light flavor, aromatics. Dijon, bigger, bolder, darker, that must hang out there. It is the complete opposite. Dijon is the first Pinot block that we bring in. And then the Swan is the one of the last Pinot blocks we bring in. And what's the deal? The Dijon just gets <clears throat> riper faster, and so therefore you don't have any more hang time available. You've got to bring the grape in. I think Otherwise it's really just the grape grape um, very specific to this vineyard. Huh. It's something that Chris hasn't seen. Her experience is longer with Pinot Noir and... Um, certainly than mine and so she has this great knowledge base about Pinot and so she's seen the opposite things hold true in other vineyards and so specifically when we talk about the Fouchain vineyard it flip-flops and we just don't understand it but we're not necessarily trying to understand it too much beyond this is what it wants to do and so we're going to let it do that. It, it, you know it, it's one thing that I think that gets discounted because you don't as a regular consumer back home you're in a store and you don't know anything about a brand but the combination of the same winemakers walking the same vineyard and understanding your the gardening essentially mm -hmm. and the expression of your garden really yeah. it, it's not there's no way a regular customer could understand it or even anyone in the napa valley or anyone living in one country but boy that alchemy can really help a winemaker know when to oh, pull the sure. trigger on yeah. let's bring this block in or that one or yeah. here's a little small section we're going to make a special wine out of yeah it. for sure i think what set chris up especially at Bouchain, um and one thing i've really learned from her is you pick for flavor and so obviously we're checking the numbers we're checking the sugar um in terms of degrees bricks b-r-i-x it's that's the the sugar terminology we use here we're also checking the ph and the ta the titratable acidity so we're checking sugar and acid um, every time we go out and taste it we're also pulling sample clusters we crush it and we get a uh, um, a juice sample from those clusters and we check those numbers and so she and i both went to uc davis we've done all the science of it so we're checking numbers but really first and foremost we're checking flavor and so something i really respect about the way chris makes wine harvest especially is pick for flavor if the numbers uh, maybe say this is your sweet spot then literally how to it, it. yeah exactly like but if it's not there in terms of flavor then you really shouldn't pick it so we have some tricks up our sleeve or tools of the trade that we can do to alter things in the winery but really if we can't if you, you can change the acid of a wine, but you can't change the flavor profile, what you've been given. My, a, another winemaker I worked with before, he likened it to catching a falling knife. And so you get <laughs> in that one spot and boom, you want to get it at that right spot. And so you, there's only so much time you yeah. can do. And when you talk it. about flavor, you're talking about not just the juice, but also, I assume, anyway, uh, the, the flavor of the grape skins that you chunk mm -hmm. on the wine. Sure. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that's going to tell you about your tannin potential, your phenolics on, on the wine, the potential that it has. And in the nomenclature of like a, a regular wine person like me, <clears throat> it's sort of like, okay, you have more sugar in your wine, eventually it's going to lead to a fatter mouthfeel probably, and yeah. more acid, yeah. a little thinner, more, more of an angular uh, character. Sure. Yeah, uh, higher sugar is going to be more alcohol, and sometimes that can certainly lend to a, a, a sort of flabbier profile. Don't talk about my double chin. <laughs> I, I said flabby, it looked right you at always, <laughs> You always inject these little things into these interviews. So more oh. sugar, tipic, your sugar is going to climb throughout harvest, and your acid is going to drop through um, 
a, a berry respiring this acid through its grape skins throughout harvest. And so your acid drops, your sugar increases. So that's kind of catching that falling knife analogy again in that right spot. If you let it get too high in sugar, um, your acid is then going to be lower. And so it's a balance of those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the college wine. It's, <laughs> there's your five ninety nine wine in the, in the local 7-Eleven. Yeah. And so we're, um, even though, going back to the swan, even though it's been out there later, it just doesn't uh, ripen, I think, with the age and um, where it's grown. It doesn't, even though it sits out there longer, the sugars aren't just going ticking up and the acid's not dropping precipitously. Oh. It ripens slower. And so that's just part of why it is what it is. And yeah. so it's a really fun thing to learn year after year. But it's something that we've just sort of said, okay, it is it is what it is and we're not gonna worry about it too much. So. Well, I hate keeping my liver waiting, so let's get to drinking <laughs> here for a second. Well, I, well, yeah, is this my question. The 17 versus the 18 to me, just to set it up, if I were going to call the 17 a violin, I'd call the 18 a, a cello. It wouldn't even be a viola. It's a, it's got a brooding sort of more nasty uh, character. It's coming at you with a, a fist for the, for the swan anyway. Yeah. And I know from my experience that this will migrate to some version of that. Yeah, for sure. Why? What's up with this? The aroma? evolution of this wine, like I, I mean, you'd have this with a barbecue practically right now. <laughs> and you'd have this with your most It's painful. still a lighter delicate. It's, it is, but you know, for those of you who have both vintages at home, if you have some friends over, or these days I guess we're all quarantined, so you can put two different parts of your personality in different rooms and just <laughs> go toggle between the rooms and smell them and taste them. But if you put them side by side, you'd never think the same person's made them or that they were from yeah. the same vineyard, I don't yeah. think. I mean, it's, it's very tangible even for me. Mm -hmm. So what's up? Well, so 17, we got a lot of, 17 was bookended by two opposites. Started with a lot of rain in 2017 and then ended with fires. And so um, a really interesting harvest. We weren't affected by the fires because we had been done with our harvest. We were picked out by that point. So we didn't have any smoke tank. Yeah, what an like that. That was. But an interesting, you know, just look at that snapshot of the year. But when you have a lot of rain in the year, your uh, soil profile gets filled uh, naturally, and we've got a nice, great growing season for it. 18 didn't have as much uh, rain. It did have some, so the soil profile, profile got filled. And then we had this sort of long... Um, we talk about heat events. We didn't have a lot of heat events throughout the year. There was, there's always one kind of proportionate heat, ripening. Yeah, sure. one always heat spike right around Labor Day that yeah. kind of kicks us in the butt, or or shortly thereafter. But nothing too crazy. 2019, no real heat events. 2018, there's one around Labor Day, I believe. 2017, I can't quite so remember the heat. Eric, would you liken it to you know, you're sautéing something at home and suddenly you turn the yeah you crank it up, crank it up <laughs> and you burn what's ever in the pan and then you turn it back down. <laughs> Yeah. You can't quite get away from the singe that you just did. Exactly. Okay. And so if you get a heat event during the year, it's going to it's gonna speed up your ripening. And so it's going to – what happens oftentimes is that even though we get these cool winds and fog that come in at night, it's not able to blow off a lot of that heat as much if it was more of a temperate – day throughout the day if you get those heat spikes a lot of that heat's going to stick around it's it's so it's not going to cool down as much at night meaning your acid's going to go away and your sugars are going to climb it's also going to change that flavor profile because you have intense heat ripening those berries and so your ripening happens a bit quicker and so we know we hope we know that some of these are going to pop up um Maybe it's a few days before, a week before, so we're able to try to mitigate those and say, okay, let's bring it in before it goes too far and gets overripe. Um, or you say, okay, it could sit through that, so we could maybe put some irrigation water on that kind of thing. So there are tricks to the trade to deal I, with that. I once sat in watching a winemaker talk to during a really hot year, and he was he was uh, trying to produce a great cab, and so. He called the owner of the of the winery of the of the vineyard, and said, "You know, I think we can get through the weekend, and I just want a little bit more uh, interesting flavor in the grape skins." And the uh, vineyard owner was like, "Well, you know, we just lost fifty percent of the fruit last week. Can you call the 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 company that's managing our, my vineyard and see what they think?" So he yeah. calls the 
the vineyard management company, and they're like, if we don't bring it in by Friday, you're going to have nothing left. <laughs> Winemaker's like, nah. calls the owner again and says, I, you know, they don't think we can get through the weekend, but actually it looks, I've been going on weather.com. It looks like oh, it's going to be more mild. I think we can get through to Monday or Tuesday. Vineyard owner call, asked him to call the vineyard management company again. Vineyard management company is like, you are insane. <laughs> uh, and this goes, I watched it for several hours, go back and forth. The guy's on the phone. Finally, they decide to pick on Friday instead of when the winemaker wanted to pick on a Monday or Tuesday. It seems to me that one of the benefits here is we're kind of a, a you know, Bouchain, like so many other great houses and storied houses, we've been here a long time. Mm. We're an integrated system. And yeah, we yeah, we yeah. control our own fate, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we, we do. And we all become uh, amateur meteorologists at, at <laughs> harvest time. But we work with a vineyard management team that we've worked with for a long time. And they, they, they know the property as well. They were here before, Chris and I. And so they've got experience here. And so they're able, we're able to talk about it. And, you know, ultimately we do what... Chris would love to do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, you know she, she if I begged her that one more day, wouldn't she? No. Now so tell me something. Between these two, um, wouldn't you pay right now, in the incarnation of these two ones, the development, they both have probably several years to go. Oh yeah, bottle, sure. yeah. But right now, wouldn't you pair them with two different kinds of food? Yeah, for sure. This one, I mean, for me, it just has so much more of that darker baking spice. In yeah. It. It's, it's got more of an oak presence on the palate as well. Even though our oak regime for these wines is, for the Swan clone in particular, about 20% new French oak. That means if we have, let's just say, for the sake of this, 10 barrels of wine that will be the Swan clone, only two of those would be brand new barrels imparting oak flavor. Maybe two of them or one of them would be a one-year-old, still a little bit of oak to give up, and the rest are what we call neutral. So two or three years and older. You're just sitting there breathing. So yeah. And so then when we blend those 10 together to make the blend, only 20% of that wine has that new French oak flavor or um, structure added to it. So this one right now shows it on the Woo! palette for me. Yeah. Um, it's got a set too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit of tramp stamps. That's it, 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 it's dancing with the golfs in yeah. San Francisco. <laughs> so it does have this evolution when we blend it though, the Swan clone in particular, of in barrel, it's real fresh. It's got that fresh cinnamon that I mentioned. It's got the strawberry tops. It has, um, and I'm sort of a broken record when I talk about our wines because I always talk about freshness in our wines. Pinot Noir, you really get that. It's another reason why I love Pinot is because, I mean, you don't walk out of a cab cellar and be like, oh, that was real fresh, baby. <laughs> Pinot, you do that. Pinot <laughs> snob. <laughs> when you all visit us, eventually, when you're able to, we can take you in that cellar and taste through those wines, and you will walk out and say, those are just beautiful and Well, fresh. that is true. They don't <laughs> coat your teeth. The same. Yeah, exactly. I, sometimes I joke with guests that drinking cab all day long, especially big ones yeah. uh, that are young, it's like, drinking cream all day long and then the young ones is like cream with a lot of i don't know what uh yeah. they just stick to your teeth yeah. and sit there and sit there of course that's what makes them so beautiful and powerful as yeah. uh the depths of of uh, uh, uh wine dark sea yeah. so to speak yeah, yeah. whereas pinot noir is is in fact more it's pretty Excuse me. very yes uh -huh. so yeah. the word this isn't very helpful i see a glass but i don't know which vintage you were talking about Oh, we're it, just talking about the the wine in general, and but so, the but well, the, the, you know, the, the and two, said this, so, but I don't know what 2017, 18, which is in which glass. So the one on the right hand side is 2018, and you're so right to ask because even here, and I'm sitting in front of the wines, I can barely tell the difference in color. If we had a Cabernet next to us, it'd be five times as dark as these two, and we could easily talk about the difference and you could see it at home. But really the experience right now, in my mind, is more in the aroma. It's shocking. The 17 is, is not nearly as bold as the 18. Yeah, for sure. And so I apologize about that. You're absolutely right. So right now we're trying to imagine the difference. Well, we're trying to describe the difference. And then not only in the growing season, but how it translates to how you handled these wines. Did you mm -hmm. change anything differently between We don't do a lot of difference. Um, in particular when it comes to the vinification of these wines. And so th there are going to be differences between 17, 18, 19, uh, 15, 16, 17 through 19 as well for, for the Swan clone. 
it will depend on crop size. It, it differs. The tons per acre is probably two and a half to three tons per acre. And so depending on the size that it comes in on each vintage, um, there'll be small difference in terms of how we uh, uh, make the wine. But typically, especially for the Swan clone, what we do is we de-stem the berries. We're not gonna introduce any stems into this, even though sometimes it tastes like there has been some stem inclusion because you get a lot of spiciness from stem inclusion. We don't, so we de-stem the berries. We put it into um, an open top fermentation vessel. And when you use an open top tank, we have what's called a punch down device. And so the punch down versus pumping the juice up and over the top with a punch down device, it's like steeping a tea bag into the liquid. And so we're, we're not gonna extract, uh, uh, over extract the wine, which we want with the Swan. We wanna maintain its, uh, its um, finesse and its nuance. And so with the Swan especially, an open top, punch it down, and we're not gonna let it get hot. Heat is gonna extract more phenolics into the wine, and so that would increase the body and the structure. If these wines have too much structure, um, they will uh, overwhelm the palate, yeah. And so these, even though there's quite a bit of difference right now, especially 17 versus 18, 18 shows we're like, it does have structure. A lot more spice. Yeah. You guys, when you're not talking, you mics. No one else. Does anyone else? I want this. Now I'll be talking. Uh, vineyard how they tons an acre yield, or three tons, or four tons an acre. If you were accountants, you'd be interested to know that if you maybe you had four tons an acre, you'd be you'd be timesing that by about eight thousand dollars a ton if it were Cabernet, or maybe. Four thousand dollars a ton for Pinot. Sure. Um, but if if Bouchain were after um, matching the price point for your five ninety nine red wine or a, a low by the glass price point for um, seven dollars or something, we could actually have a vineyard out there that that had double the amount yeah. of tons per acre, eight tons. If we wanted to really produce a uh, cooking wine or, or some sort of, uh, well, you know, it was quite shocking to me to, to hear that uh, a big volume producer for certain varietals could get tw as much as 26 tons an acre. Yeah. But at 26 tons an acre, your Cabernet would be worth a dollar a ton or something. Yep. Probably, right? probably. So, you know, we're <laughs> like so many of your favorite wine brands at home, Bouchain is in uh, kind of a, I don't want to say a snobby tier, but we're very careful about the type of, of flavors that we're offering. So you're saying that for both 17 and 18, uh, similar, they're not, not so drastic a year. It's not like one was a drought year and one had a ton of rain. Not really. Uh, you kind of treated these the same way, and yet at this point in their evolution, the personality is so divergent, and yet it's just a function of sort of their release time and their time gestating yeah. in bottle? I think what happens, especially for the swans, is that um, when they're in barrel, they have, when we're blending them, we're looking for those really fresh, vibrant, fresh cinnamon, and then the strawberry tops, um, the French strawberry, those little strawberries that have like a real pretty winemaker. I, I remember <laughs> when I first got here, a friend of mine who's a winemaker asked me, do you, do you smell that, Brian? I'll be like, uh, yeah. Do you, do you smell the orange? Um, not so much. No, I, I don't know. Well, I don't mean the orange. I mean the orange peel. Not, no, not so much. Actually, I don't mean the, I mean the inside of the orange peel. Yeah. Right. And at that point, I'm just like, you know, I don't care anymore. So what do you mean by your so strawberry? These little friend, I call them French strawberries. I don't know. I could be very wrong. But they're these tiny little strawberries and they have this real sweet, inherent sweetness to them. Like they actually exist like, in the real world? They do exist, they're okay. not just in my mind. mind. I do make so them worse. viewers could actually go. <laughs> you can find okay. these at some point. Just check. And they have this beautiful sort of confectioner sugar um, sweetness to it, which always lifts the aromatics like that. It's almost like a strawberry soap, which sounds kind of bad, but it has just this really uh, floral You're, you're not relating our wine to straw to soap. <laughs> Chris will kill you. you yeah, so she will. <laughs> How do I delete this? <laughs> <laughs> and so evolution in barrel goes to that real freshness and then the, the, the light cinnamon. And then, so this got bottled in August, and beginning of August, I believe. And so right now, it hasn't had a lot of time yeah, of 2019, we're in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so it hasn't had a ton of time in bottle and so opening it up now it's more we, we call it wound up it just doesn't feel as loose you could liken that to if you took a bottle of wine taste it right away and then let it sit out for an hour two hours three hours and you constantly so taste really it make a difference it too. sort of unwinds and so it changes the way you perceive it on the nose the palate and on the actual physical presence on your palate and so right now this 18 likely is more wound up and so it's just showing sort of this um attention uh, bulkier structure so it is it, it, it's yeah. bulky yeah. yeah it's it's more muscular but the when i taste it i sort of uh, I know that tasting the acid and the palate weight, but it's just evolved close to this uh, more fresh version in 17 C, where it got it's all evolving more back to that fresh cinnamon versus more of like a darker baking spice nutmeg. Uh, I have a question that might be useful being in store, let alone from the country that's watching. If you're in store right now. Even for the very best or the very worst producers, and you're paying attention, you want to buy a or Mirabelle or something, almost consistent better off buying. Well, I, if Love you could, uh, if you weren't, uh, it's okay. I love it. When it comes to you know, Rieslings, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Riesling's Chardonnays, I love some age on a Chardonnay. Um, the only thing I usually don't drink older is a rosé. That's just because it's so fresh and it goes perfect with sunshine. Um, now available. <laughs> <laughs> we do have rosé, those of you who drink it. And then Pinot, I think it's really fun to have a little bit of age on it. Even the year is going to make a difference, like we're really seeing right here. And so um, there is, you know, I, again, we're so opinionated on our own wines, like, or a Pinot in particular, a young Pinot, you can drink a lot sooner than you can um, the uh, sibling to the north in the Napa Valley, the Cabernet. the Cabernets. And so I think it's, you can obviously open them sooner and enjoy them um, a little bit sooner, Chris. Hopefully that's not our boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a little bit of age, I think, does help on a Pinot. They're, they're just so fun. And I, I, for me, it's that slight shift in the aromatics from something that's um, real bright and fresh to something that's, you know, more sort of rustic, that kind of thing. Showing the earth, like the, the way we talk about earth, um, especially if you have a G open or a G vineyard Pinot Noir recently, you've for me, I call it black earth. Um, it's just like uh, that dark, dark earth. I come from the Midwest, and my brother used to shove my face in dirt. So <laughs> I know, but you have a very unique experience. I mean, the different soil types I <laughs> from childhood memories. Um, hello. People. Hey, everybody. Well, um, and so a little bit of age, I think, is a really fun thing, especially on Pinot. We've had some older Pinots and uh, the festivals we go to, and we have them here. And they, they, it's just such a fun wine. It's typically got enough acid in there for a red wine that holds it. It acts like a backbone, so you're able to taste it uh, for years to go. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I mean, fun. especially with Cabernet, you know, we drink uh, wines in America like five minutes after we buy it. <laughs> so, you know, you get that huge force field in Cabernet and it, and it prevents you from really experiencing the, the fruit character so to some extent underneath it all. It's like, yeah. uh, I don't know, too much sugar in your tea or something like that. You just yeah. can't taste the rest of it, the rest of the nuance. And for those of you, by the way, who, who when we, you know, I've oftentimes noticed this, you buy a bottle of wine, it's got all the meat on the bones you want. It's dense, it's huge, you can practically chew it, but it has no aroma. Yeah. And don't you think that one of the, a lot of the great Pinots and maybe of the great wines, they have enough acid to let the aroma oh, for sure. uh, taunt you from yeah, the definitely. glass. Yeah. You can really taste it better as yeah. a consequence. Yeah. Uh, since coming here, you know, in the East Coast, if any of you are logged in from the East Coast, 
we always used to drink old wine, and one of the real great fun things for me was go to a restaurant with a great wine list and order something that yeah. was 20 years old or 15. You can't get that out here. Winemakers make fun of my palate, so I like <laughs> old wine, and, the, and all you guys think that, oh, that's over the hill, Brian. You're drinking, you know, uh, it's five years past its prime. Brian loves a lot of shoe leather in his wine. <laughs> well, you know, as a wine ages, it does have a different aromatic, maybe a little yeah. bit more pronounced aromatic, and a in a more, uh, in some ways, uh, luxurious mouthfeel. You don't, yeah, you're not sure. punched in the face by yeah. all the tannin. One Absolutely. of the differences between uh, Pinot Noir and Cab is the th the skins are so thin. You don't get that huge tannin density like mm -hmm. you do from Cabernet. Yeah. The thicker skin grapes. Yeah. But one of the things that the Swan brings to us, and I know this from what you and Chris have taught me, that blew me away to go out there and taste the Pomard clone, which is noticeably thicker and more yeah. chewy compared to the swan, and it translates to a very different mouthfeel in the wine. Yeah, definitely. That thick skin, it's got more phenolics. At, um, it's going to provide more structure to the actual finished wine. It's like eating a blueberry versus, you know, some more strawberry, cranberry, fresher, tartar berries. So, <laughs> so if everyone's in the store and you're looking at Pinot Noir from around the world, you might see some from France. At, 12 and a half percent 13 and a yeah. half actually you might see some of the most expensive bottles in the world of caber of cabernet based blends at 12 and a half or 13 and a half percent the um and here in, in napa we do with cabernet blend uh that grape with cabernet franc and, and yeah. petite verdot and other things and they bring a little different uh it's sort of like adding spices to a special sauce but in the world of snobby Anyway, I know if we wanted to make all of these more thick and dense, we could add Syrah and oh, probably yeah. no one would notice. Yeah. But in the snobby world of of Pinot, the tradition that comes down from Burgundy is you don't blend it with anything. And in our snobby world, our snobbiest, our, our most boutique <laughs> wines, we <laughs> don't, no this stuff. is 100% Swan, right? Yeah, 100% Swan, <clears throat> Pinot Noir, all <clears throat> Pinot in there. And so for anyone at home who's, who's toggling between the vintages, it's not because Eric and Chris lost their mind, as far as I know, <laughs> that we have a vintage uh, it's debatable. Yeah, it's it's a part of the gestation. They're taking a deep breath in the mm -hmm. bottle, so to speak. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, we, we want to really maintain the style of the swan. It, it's going to show differences. That's just the nature of wine. But I think as they age, they'll become you know, closer in that style. So they show their differences earlier on and then they'll merge. And the molecules literally integrate, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what happens in the bottle, right? You have the, the molecules from that you get from the grape skins as well yeah. as the juice and they kind of synthesize. Um, does anyone have a question for Eric? Because I always feel guilty when I give wine tastings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm we can blabber on today. I'm just, well, and I'm also, I'm just the talking head. It's so rare. When I, I really like these virtual tastings when we can have the opportunity to have Eric and Chris here because yeah. You can sort of, uh, it's like the great Oz, you unveil the curtain and there they are. Um, <laughs> feel free to ask any questions. And if you want to type any questions in, I, I can read them if I put my glasses back. Yeah, we want to make these as enjoyable for See, you. See, somebody and does have talk a, at you, potentially. At you, so. uh, my singing voice isn't what it used to be. So <laughs> Mine see. is, so buckle up. No, just kidding. <laughs> but can you tell vineyard location versus clone in taste? So let, let's um, let's let's parse that out. If we had uh, Pinot Noir from Carneros versus Anderson Valley versus Burgundy, yeah. could you tell the difference and why? And then uh, think of all the different clones you and Chris like to work with. I know we've got mm -hmm. other clones that are just coming on board now. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how you're going to use them. Could you consistently tell or? Do you sometimes like to think up? so? If you gave us an Anderson Valley versus Carneros versus Burgundy, um, they have their inherent differences. I, you know, especially Boucher wines stick out like a sore thumb, a beautiful and delicious sore thumb for me when we put them in the lineup. And then when you put it something like a neighbor of ours, like Anderson Valley, those wines typically for me, I don't know about everybody else, but they have this sort of earthy mushroom characteristic to them. And by Anderson Valley, you mean an area that's about 45 miles from here yeah. or so. Yeah. So uh, I don't it's know. been shocking to me since arriving here from the East Coast in Napa. If you drive five minutes north from Bouchain, you drive out of the Pinot Noir region basically into an area that is as much as 20 degrees hotter on certain days once you get about 15 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. In Sacramento, where a lot of bulk wines produced, you know, your, your favorite jug wine might be, might 
be coming from there. You can drive 100 miles and the temperature is still 120, yeah. which is approximately 25 degrees too hot for photosynthesis. So Napa and Sonoma and some of the great, the great wines that you've been used to drinking uh, inherently come from a, a, a region a little like the Swan. It's delicate in nature. There's yeah. a, a difference in, in, in temperature. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's between the different AVAs or regions or countries, there's very drastic differences between those. Now, if we took Swan and planted it on a hillside versus a low lying, deeper soil, there's going to be differences there as well. You can see that in Cabernets in Napa. You take a Howell Mountain yeah. or uh, any sort of hillside, really shallow soils versus valley floor Cabernet, there's big differences there. It's just in mouthfeel too, yeah, actually. Yeah, I was really, really shocked by that when I, even a novice, when you come to Napa, if you didn't visit wineries that are right next to each other, or at least featured wines from different parts of the valley, it, there's, there's, I can't even believe one's a cab versus a, yeah, you know, yeah. if you if you take a, a Cabernet from uh, Spring Mountain and compare it to Howell Mountain, they look at each other right across the Napa Valley, yeah. and if you flew there, it'd probably be a mile or something, and yet one gets hot afternoon sun yeah. late in the year, and the other one gets this more delicate yeah. shadowed sun, and one's lighter and one's heavier. So um, it very well, within a couple of years, we'll have these swans, these come up for from a particular block, but we replanted some swan um, out near our terraces on the southern end of the property. And so we'll at some point be able to see the very drastic differences between the swan from that block and the swan from our quote unquote older block. And so where you plant something, um, sometimes it, it can be just one block away, which is you know a matter of feet. Like the soil type and the weather that it receives can be very different the way it translates into a wine, which makes wine so interesting. Somebody is getting really snobby in us. And so I'll warn you, I mix lies with truth. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, question. Is uh, it from Brad Pitt again? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Angelo Jolie, one more time hounding our noon time broadcast. When I recently looked up the Pomard Club, it's often contrasted with a Wadden Swill Club. Wadden Swill. I think they grow a lot of that in Oregon. Is there any of it in Carneros or at Boucher? The Vaudensville clone, I can't I remember its history. It, um, it goes by a number, oh, and uh, oh, sure, I can make something. <laughs> up. Um, I don't believe we have it. I forget what uh, clone number it goes by. I can whoever um, asks the question, I can do some more research on this. And if you send an email, I'm happy to provide. Is it from one. Germany, given the name? Or? Uh, sounds like German or Swiss. Yeah. Um, so it'd be a cooler climate clone in general, a la Oregon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perhaps the you know if you guys own the vineyard at home, you wouldn't plant it all in one clone apparently because they don't do they they're not they each clone cannot deal with differences uh, universally in rain or 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 sunshine or yeah. So if you had a vineyard in Oregon depending on the soil, you might plant very different clones than what you would plant here. Oh, and sure. any of you on the East Coast, uh, there are a bunch of vineyards, of course, in Long Island and, uh, and in Virginia. Uh, they don't necessarily, they're not even necessarily interested in some of the, some of the uh, clones or even the varietals that we are here. And I'd say that, out of, am I wrong? Out of yes. all of the Pinots, <laughs> Oregon Pinot in general tends to be, because it's cooler up there, lighter in color, more strawberry. It probably has the most in common with our swan clone uh, than anything else, I, just in terms of yeah, expression. I oftentimes liken that to, or think that to be true. The weather is changing in Oregon like it's changing yeah. here. And so, um, especially 10 years ago, that that statement was very, very true. Uh, it's changing a bit, but um, in general, their wines are going to be um, a bit lighter and maybe not quite as much color. But uh, it's so I was just smelling these again. Um, the 17 really opens up and becomes that very typical swan clone that we have here. The, Bird with the, others. Yeah, the, 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 I, I forget my word association that's in my tasting notes, but swan clone, swan lake, ballet, ballet dancer. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. think of a ballet dancer, yeah. they've got grace and power. And so that's what this wine has for me. It's not weak by any means. It's still got nice structure to it. It's just lighter on the palate. And so it's, you don't want to... Um, I, you don't want to think, oh, it's a you know light and 
fresh and fruity wine. It's it's got structure yeah. to it. It's just not overly massive. It's very um, smooth and supple and um, integrated. The like meat wine tea really is there. much more spicy, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a certain there's an, another. I should have brought a uh, brass band in addition to this. I wish we could you know, sort of hold the the color up. These two, the color is not going to change too much, no, really. But if we had our Dijon clone. It would essentially like be a Cabernet versus these other one, these Swan clones. These are much lighter in color. When Chris and I sit down a couple times throughout the year, along with Hannes, our assistant winemaker, um, as a team, we sit down and we look at all of our Pinots and we do them blind and say, oh, that's the G, that's the Swan. And it's almost unfair having the Swan in the lineup because you look at it and it's like, well, that's the Swan. So I'm definitely going to get that one. <laughs> <laughs> so many, um Somebody wants to know if I'm secretly the winemaker or uh, no, I'm joking. No, he's um, just holding it. So. Does, before we go, you guys, do you have any other questions for Eric, um, either about the Swan Club or about your favorite vintages? Uh, I think right now in store shelves all over the country, uh, the Pinots are probably just now switching. So, you're, 16, you know, if you've been 16 going... To some, maybe 17, yeah. I don't know if the 17s are coming out, but... Meanwhile, Cab is going to be... Mm, 15, 16, 16 yeah. at this point. So that's one of the reasons why Cabernet always has a, yeah. an older vintage. One it thing ages. I, just, yeah, I will say is what we've tried to do with some of those crescendo wines is provide ones that have a little bit of age on them so within a club shipment sometimes to just say like here's like a Chardonnay or a Pinot that's got a year or two more yeah. than... And so it's really fun to just see the differences, especially in Pinot and how they evolve. You don't have to have such a large snapshot of time to say, oh, there's the difference. Uh, yeah, it doesn't take true. 20 years with Pinots and Chardonnays. You can see that difference a little bit sooner, which for me is really fun. You know, they still have the ability to go a long time, but they, you know, they can unwind a little bit sooner, which is, is great. Um, personal opinion. You know, for those of you who <laughs> might want to have a, a, your own private uh, you know, appointment for a virtual tasting. If you have the 2015 vintage from us at home, 14, excuse me, I'd say it, it is notably different from the more fruitier styles that we've got going forward. And um, it is a fun point, counterpoint. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see the expression uh, of the wines. Yeah, you, uh, anyway, and I'm sorry, I keep going back to these. They're just so different on the nose. Yeah, they are. It's just, yeah. As they all sit here and we'll taste them, they'll sort of merge together, especially the nose. They, when we opened up the 2017 earlier on, it had so much like dark cherry in there, but now that's evolved with some air over an hour or so into that real sort of um, snap pea, we call it, or fresh cinnamon. Uh, for me, this is just such a fun wine. It really is a great representative of the Bouchain wines, I think, mm. in general. You know, it's got the ability to last a long time, but it's still easy to drink and fun early on. So buy your wine. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fun footnote, and I don't know if you feel it's true, but I had a winemaker once tell me that the average vineyard in California gets ripped up at about 16 years. And it, the unfortunate part is that it takes about 18 years for a vineyard to really establish itself <laughs> as the spirit of the place that it's in. So for any of you who like Bouchain's wines over the years, not only do we have a wonderful one-two punch of a, a consistency in our winemaking program with winemakers and a consistency, a consistency of a vineyard, but we've got an old vineyard. Mm -hmm. So our wines do kind of have a spirit of the place. And and we've talked about the G Vineyard before, and it, and it likewise, it's an yeah, old vineyard. Much. It's it's not just a vineyard that, we, um, that we're producing for bulk wine production. And it's worth noting that I mean, Bouchain could make seven, eight times more wine than we do and we opt to be a more boutique part of the market. Yeah. So in the Swan Clone, uh, what, 400 cases or less yeah. a year, right? Yeah. So, you know, anything you're touching in the store shelf, you can be pretty, pretty sure it's 40,000 cases, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, or more, uh, certainly at a, at a lower price point. Um, so you, Pino, would be a fun one to do something like this if people were interested. We yeah. can talk about the real differences of the vintage. That's Shocking one that's, difference, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, still within its, uh, you know, lives within its boundaries of like, oh, that's a G Pino, but each vintage is is different. And again, uh, that's what makes wine so much more fun than all those other beverages out there, right? It, it shows that nuance between vintage and winemaker and uh, you know winery and. Um, any other questions? Yes, one, one last. Uh, well, 
uh, now's the time to ask any questions. We've got one here, and then I'll take one more if somebody has a question that you want. Um, elaborate, elaborate a little on the relationship of the winemaker to the vineyard manager, and how do they inform each other, or help each other, or not, for that matter. No, sure. Yeah, so for us, um, in particular, when Chris and I got here in 2015, we worked with a vineyard manager that had been here for, I think, at least another, well, I think about a decade prior. And so even within that company, there's been a couple of vineyard managers, but we've been working with somebody who's got some experience here on this vineyard. And so what we did right away is, is establish a relationship um, to where, without us being overly pushy, saying we're going to have a, a lot of input into the grape growing because let's face it, it's what's out there that's real special. And um, even though we've, you, you know, every winemaker's got to have some ego, right? And so uh, we like to <laughs> <It'll> be, hey, <laughs> you know, we love to think that what we're doing in the winery is so paramount, but it's really the grapes being grown out there that is so important. And we want to have an input in that. And so when it's time to prune and when it's time to leaf, when it's time to harvest, obviously, that's definitely our decision, um, whether or not there's any irrigation that's going to go on. Chris and I do not like to irrigate very much, and that's not necessarily a bone of contention, but it's something where, oh, we should be watering, and Chris and I will sort of forget to read that email. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't really feel the need to turn I, the tap no on. No one from our vineyard management team is watching this. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> they do what we say. <laughs> and so it's really about creating a teamwork between the two entities, but um, we here have a large part to do with the farming uh, plan. They have so many great ideas, and they – uh, institute and implement these practices that need to happen and they remind us what needs to happen um, but really if anything needs to be done it's it's a back and forth between the two parties mm -hmm. Chris and I and um, and now Hannes and in our vineyard management company that's not always the case at other wineries because let's say I'm a small producer and I purchase fruit from a grower, if I go out and say, do this, do that, they're gonna say, yeah, yeah, sure, and then do what they want. First and foremost, they are selling grapes. That depends if you've got a uh, per acreage or per tonnage contract. So there's leeway on how much manipulation you can do with a grower, but, they make their livelihood by selling grapes, and so they want to sell as many as possible at a certain level. Well, of quality. and I'm going to guess, and if you are a winemaker working for a huge company, the directive for the vineyards coming from the accounting team. Am I wrong? Oftentimes, yeah, yeah. So I can't say that's always true. Yes, yeah, but yeah. So you're just left with the result of yeah. what the math needs to be on the balance sheet. Sure. When or, it comes down, you know, if your farming plan is coming down to pennies per vine, it. Not to say that you can't make great wine. It's been done. It's being done right now. It's just you're creating or putting real limitations on that. If something comes up and you need to add more compost, what Chris and I do, or Chris in particular, call Mr. Copeland and says, we could really use some more compost. And he says, is it going to make the wine better? She says, yes. And he says, go for it. <laughs> and so having that leeway and then the ability to work with a vineyard management company, you know, really provides us with the foundation, the building blocks to set up every vintage as a success. When you have different relationships, whether you're a bigger winery or a much smaller winery, when you're dealing um, with sort of um, these, not always a roadblock or a bottleneck, but when there's every level between you and those grapes, um, it's just uh, an instance or a situation in which, um, you know, troubles can arise. But, you know, that's generalizing things, obviously. And there are a lot of great wineries that make wine that don't grow those grapes. But and for us, we feel very lucky that we have this amazing property and then like someone like Dr. G to work with very closely and, and come up with farming plans. And, um, you know, Chris and I aren't vineyard managers, but we, we know something about farming and we, you know, want to help every vintage. And we've been here for five vintages now, so we've seen it. We know the things that are going to pop up in terms of challenges. Hopefully there's always new ones that we know what to look for. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice... It's a very nice set setup that we have here at Boucher. We're very lucky to be well, able to do that. Let's finish today's, if you are ready. We'll finish today's um, uh, conversation with a toast to Mr. and Mrs. Copeland and yeah. to Chris.
Uh, so, and to our Thanks. customers, Cheers. thank you for everything and best wishes to you Cheers. and your families and friends out in the real world. Yeah. Cheers, Cheers. from Napa. Cheers. <laughs> that will get six feet apart. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, guys. Yeah. Close the meeting. Otherwise, Goodbye, I'm going to hear all the things that we said. <laughs>